Hello, everyone. My name is Brendan Edgerton, Director of Circular Economy for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. I'd like to thank UN University for inviting me to be one of the keynote speakers today, uh, presenting on circular economy and the activities that are happening within the private sector. Uh, I'll go through a little bit of what we're seeing today globally uh, on circular economy as a topic, uh, touch on why it's of interest to the business and, and private sector, uh, and of course, what we're doing as the World Business Council for Sustainable Development on the topic, and of course, you know what we feel is needed uh, to help us uh, move quicker in circular economy when it comes to questions that still remain. So we'll get started. So I'm sure many of you uh, have seen discussions, particularly here in Europe, uh, where circular economy has come to uh, the top of the news feed, uh, whether it's the New Green Deal. Uh, the elements within that of the Circular Economy Action Plan, uh, or going further back to the beginning of the year uh, before the pandemic uh, has really wreaked havoc on uh, the globe, uh, looking at where we were with respect to our resource consumption as a planet um, and noting how much that is growing every year. It's to the point where circular economy is even a discussion in some publications where we would have not assumed that they would be in for quite some time, such as Forbes or Fortune, um, even The Economist. Um, as we look at where circular economy is uh, with respect to searches, for example, this is from Google Trends and seeing how circular economy is trending uh, since 2012, and this was around one of the first reports of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you can see that the interest in it is, continues to grow. Uh, and not only that, it continues to grow globally. So what this uh, chart here shows is uh, the global interest in the concept. Obviously, the darker the blue, uh, the more searches for circular economy in that geography. Um, not surprising, you'll see quite a bit of uh, searches within Europe, but you'll probably notice that it is increasingly global uh, and the search um, or interest in the topic continues to grow around the world. So where we are today? When it comes down to it, uh, recent studies have shown that we are only about 8% circular today as a global economy. And that's actually down from 2019, where we were estimated to be at 9.1% circular. So not only are we low in how circular we are, we're also heading the wrong direction. The International Resource Panel, I'm sure you guys are plenty familiar with, uh, have produced some extremely valuable reports and insights that we feed to our members uh, and use for communicating the urgency to move towards circularity. Uh, this uh, recent report uh, discussed how much we are growing in the resource consumption uh, on an annual basis, uh, not only in global resource use, but also in material demand per capita and ultimately material productivity. Uh, and what this recent study showed is that global resource use has more than tripled since 1970. Uh, not only that, but global material demand per capita has actually grown uh, from 7.4 tons to 12.2 uh, between 1970 and 2017. And lastly, that material productivity has actually started to decline uh, around 2000 and has stagnated since. Beyond this, uh, they found just the extraction and processing of materials, fuels, and food are responsible for 90% of biodiversity loss we have today, 90% of water stress, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, and 33% of pollution health impacts. On top of all this, we have an extremely unequal um, spread uh, or share of how resources are flowing through the economy. You can see high income uh, on the left-hand side compared to the low income. Uh, if unchecked, um, as far as moving more, to, if, we are, if we fail to move more towards a circular economy, uh, global material use would more than double between 2015 and 2060. That's after tripling over the last 50 years. Um, so there is urgent need for action as we have only one planet uh, as uh, the opportunity for moving towards circularity and decoupling uh, resource growth from uh, or resource consumption from financial performance uh, is becoming more and more attractive. And this is why uh, 
increasingly we see more and more businesses uh, within WBCSD, but also outside of our organization, interested in circularity uh, and what it means for their business. Uh, we did a study uh, some years back to understand, you know, why were companies moving towards circularity in the first place? And uh, through those interviews and surveys, uh, we broadly found there are eight different reasons why they are moving towards circularity, and those fall across three different categories. So the first category is on accelerating growth, that companies uh, can generate or create additional revenue from existing products and services, that they can innovate, they find the circular economy spurs innovation uh, of new products and services, uh, and often in the beginning of the company's circular economy journey, when they're looking at waste reduction and improving diversion from landfill, they can often find that it actually reduces moderating co operating costs. Second category is on enhancing competitiveness. Uh, it allows them to captivate their customer and employee relationships. Uh, it allows them to differentiate themselves from the competition. Uh, and also, uh, if done most effectively, you can begin to integrate your corporate strategy in, based on circularity and tying that with your, your mission. And lastly, mitigating risk. And this is probably one of the most uh, relevant topics today in, in light of COVID and the need for more resilient business models is circularity can increasingly uh, improve uh, the resilience of a company through adaptation or having companies uh, exposed to the adaptation of business models and value chain relationships and understanding uh, what their risks uh, might be to, by continuing to depend on uh, linear models uh, and also mitigate linear risk exposure. And this could be in the form of uh, markets, this could be in the form of brand and reputation, um, but it is important for a company to understand what are the risks of their business based on assuming that we can continue to operate the economy. So how is it actually uh, gaining traction within the business community and particularly within executives? Uh, so we uh, did another study uh, a couple of years ago uh, called the New Big Circle, where we published uh, a number of insights that we, ha we collected from our members and beyond. Uh, this study found that 97% of those surveyed, they that circular economy was more important today than it was three years ago. Perhaps not that surprising. But a 93% believe that circular economy is important for their company's success in the future. That's a very large amount, and that is not just tied to the sustainability, sustainability performance, but it's tied uh, directly towards the company's bottom line. And then lastly, 85% expect to make higher investments in circular economy projects in the future. So you see, these, number, these numbers are very high, uh, and uh, it is something to recognize that uh, business does see this as a high priority and a high opportunity. So we dug a little bit deeper into this. Um, and what are the, the drivers um, for executives in moving towards circularity? And we found that they fall into two categories, internal and external. On the external side, we found that the first reason why they were moving towards uh, circularity was actually in customers. The second, regulators, and number three, in public opinion. On the internal side, those most keen to move towards circularity started actually at top management, uh, followed by the sustainability department, and then third, at the strategy department, which you see a significant drop off there. And I'd imagine uh, with these results being done uh, about a year and a half, 18 months ago, uh, that we would see some significant changes in this, such as on the external side, I'd imagine investors would have crept up there at this point uh, based on the discussions we've heard. Um, and I would imagine on the internal side, the strategy department, perhaps even procurement and risk uh, would appear up there. So how does a company actually implement circularity? Uh, this uh, comes from the same report. We found that that broadly falls across across four different uh, phases. The, the first one is on sustainability departments recognizing the opportunity and perhaps incubating some projects or pilots within the company. The second phase is where top management takes decisions and deploys resources. This is where they just decide that this is going to be uh, not just a sustainability project, but this is going to be a corporate uh, uh, corporate strategy, um, uh, an element of uh, dispersing across the business unit. On stage three, the sustainability department perhaps incubates and fosters and developments of additional circular economy projects to complement those. Uh, and then lastly, in stage four, uh, this is where ultimately it becomes the responsibility 
of the business units to implement circularity projects. Uh, and increasingly, this is not looked at as just projects, uh, but actually just looked at the, as the uh, ongoing way of doing regular business. And so how companies uh, evolve in their thinking with, related to, with respect to circularity, often it, it starts with process innovation. Um, and this is, you know, how do we reduce waste? How do we eliminate waste altogether in our operations and processes? That evolves into a more uh, mature thinking of how do we embed circularity into the products or the services that we put out onto the market? Uh, this is a higher degree of innovation. It requires many more stakeholders within the company to be involved. And then lastly, is the business model innovation that we all hope to see uh, within companies it is certainly the most difficult to implement. It does require by far the most stakeholders to be involved, not only within the company, but also outside of the company. So how is this working in practice? And there's a couple of examples here we can share, um, and two, two of my favorite ones. Uh, the first one is from DSM Niaga. Uh, DSM Niaga uses a technology to create a 100% recyclable carpet product without any VOCs. Uh, and ultimately, this technology that they've developed uh, allows manufacturers to easily separate the carpet fiber and backing without compromising the quality of the original product or the materials therein. Uh, this all came about through the original design philosophy that Niaga was founded on. Niaga, you'll probably note backwards, is again. Uh, the design philosophy is simple, very simple. Three things. Number one, keep it simple. Uh, use the lowest possible diversity of ingredients, recognizing how much uh, difficulty that creates uh, when trying to recover or recycle materials at end of life. The second is clean materials only. So only use materials that have been tested for their impact on our health and the environment. Uh, and then lastly, number three, use reversible connections. Something that is often underlooked, or if looked at at all, uh, is to connect different materials only in ways in which it could be decoupled after use. So a strong bonding adhesive uh, that would not be, uh, that is typically used within carpets that would not uh, meet their criteria and so they had to go back to the drawing board. Ultimately what they created was a, a mono material carpet um, that could as a whole be thrown back into the recovery or reprocessing line after use and turn it into a brand new carpet uh, as it is. Another example of moving from a product to a service line is Michelin Fleet Solutions. Uh, and here, Michelin, uh, using its fleet tire management solution called FE Tires, uh, they've converted from selling tires to these companies to actually selling kilometers or miles. Uh, and the customers pay a monthly fee uh, based on the travel miles. Uh, the service program keeps the fleets running optimally. Um, while also consistent product quality reduces risk and performance. The, additionally, um, because the tires are maintained and monitored to ensure that they're running optimally, uh, the, uh, the fleets are actually running at a higher fuel efficiency range. On top of that, uh, companies are able to reduce their risk in the volatility and uncertainty of cash flows associated with unpredictable damage and irregular purchase costs. So what are we doing as WBCSD? I highlighted two examples. They're actually from two members uh, of WBCSD. Uh, and just to give a little snapshot of what we're doing, uh, what you see on the left-hand side are the six programs that are offered by World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Hopefully uh, you have heard of us before, but if not, we are a uh, member organization, nonprofit of over 200 companies uh, committed, towards, committed towards driving uh, sustainable solutions uh, to a world in which 9 billion people can live well within the means of the planet. We anticipate or we expect that more sustainable business will be more successful in the future. And so we're trying to get our members there uh, and using our safe platform to bring companies together and co-develop solutions to share challenges. So within WBCSD, Circular Economy is one of the six programs that we have. But you also see that we work within cities and mobility Climate and energy is certainly one of our oldest programs. Uh, redefining value, uh, looking at the financial system and how to integrate social uh, and natural capital into the ongoing financial uh, ecosystem. Uh, food and nature, 
uh, people program is looking at SDGs and human rights. But within that circular economy program, we have our flagship circular economy project, Factor 10, uh, which you see on the right-hand side. And that uh, involves 35 companies that we work with across 15 industries and 15 countries. And then we work with them across these six work streams. So the first one is on metrics. And here is where we developed our circular transition indicators that was published in January of this year. This is a common methodology for companies to measure their circular performance uh, and use to use as internal decision making and inform that top management uh, of where the company stands with respect to circularity and what are the risks and opportunities of the business in doing that. Another work stream is on policy, uh, where we've done quite a bit of landscaping to help our members understand what are the national and regional circular economy policies that are coming out or that are out today, and what are the implications on specific value chains or industries. Then we have four sector deep dives, bioeconomy, electronics, buildings, plastics, and packaging. Uh, they're all at various stages of uh, maturity, depending on the value chain conversation. Um, uh, but just to give you an example of what we're doing within that, uh, on the building side, uh, we published a report with Circular Economy on how the value chain can move towards circularity um, uh, step by step and understanding specific actions that each part of the value chain can take. And then what are the actions that both the private sector and the public sector need to take in order to make that happen? Now we are looking at uh, how to, what's really needed is defining the business case for circular construction, uh, that uh, we see many solutions, both products and services that are available from companies further down the value chain within the construction sector. Uh, but increasingly, there's, it's becoming clear that the demand for circular solutions isn't there at the beginning of the value chain with real estate development and finance. Even the conversation of circularity might not even be there. And so what we want to do is put this on the radar of the beginning part of that value chain and help them understand what is the value that circularity could bring them with the expectation then we can help them uh, implement that into their regular practices afterwards. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we work with a number of different companies, in fact, 35, over 15 different industries. These are the companies here that we work with. You see Factor 10 in the middle there, uh, and the wide range of companies um, that we work with across the Factor 10 program, uh, everything from chemicals to electronics, building materials, uh, to tech, uh, oil and gas, consumable goods, and waste management, waste management, recycling, resource management companies. Uh, so quite a variety, which also uh, creates more robust outputs afterwards. So with WBCSD, what we do is collect member input. We leverage that with the knowledge and expertise that we have across the network and also across the house of WBCSD in the six programs. And we build strategic alliances of other organizations, uh, government sectors, uh, to bring together, to bring the right people uh, to the table to tackle the challenge at hand. We do this through Factor 10, we do this through our CE Hub, which is a series of services we offer our members, and we do it through support of other organizations, such as the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, which we are a founding strategic partner on uh, to this day. And ultimately, what we aim to do is provide the standards, the tools, advocacy, coalitions, and knowledge to our members and beyond, uh, and doing that through podcasts, reports, events, policies, discussions, um, and uh, help get the message out of what circular economy is, what it means to business, and how they can get started. Uh, organizers, um, and one more item before uh, closing it completely is just to put something on everyone's radar here. Uh, and that's what we still do not know. Uh, there's many different things we do not know. There's many things that if we did know could help us move a lot faster and inform our members of the best course of action. So just generally highlighting these, uh, the first one is recovery rates of different materials at the country level to inform business decisions, accountability, and stimulate action. With our circular transition indicators, we're increasingly pushing companies to understand this information and to ask for this information, assuming that they don't have it. Um, so if we have clear and clear pictures of what is available to them uh, in terms of this data, uh, we are happy to work with whomever may have it, many different organizations potentially, uh, to bring this in through CTI, the Circular Transition Indicators. Another one is which countries and economies are most vulnerable or stand the most to gain from a transition to a linear economy. 
just as companies uh, look can look at this as a competitive advantage, uh, different national uh, governments, national economies should also be taking that similar lens. Another item is how to tap into behavioral economics and consumer behavior to persuade them towards more circular products and services. Understanding that if all costs are equal, uh, we would hope that they would move towards these circular uh, solutions as product as a service or um, increase recycled content, et cetera, um, but that hasn't always demonstrated to be the case. Another option is how are industry conventions and standard practices anchoring us in the linear economy? So I mentioned the real estate uh, development and finance conventions that could be holding us back today. Another one is uh, just looking at accounting and the concept of depreciation uh, and how is that uh, uh, reinforcing the linear model that we have today. Another, how to quickly and efficiently quantify environmental and social impacts of circular solutions and material flows. This is uh, uh, one that is a big challenge for many institutions and we're looking to make that connection um, very soon. Uh, when are bioeconomy solutions within food and feed, products and materials and energy beneficial for the environment and when may they be detrimental? Um, how can we design and build a more circular renewable energy infrastructure as many of those assets are now coming off the market? And what are the impacts of circular economy on existing jobs? How will they change? Who should be trained? Uh, and what sort of uh, training or reskilling should they be going through? So with that, uh, I'd like to, again, thank UN University for the invitation to uh, share a few thoughts here. Um, if you have any follow-up connections, feel free to connect uh, with me through Twitter or LinkedIn and be happy to carry on the conversation uh, and learn from what you all are doing as well. So thank you very much.